uh, I will try to be brief. As, as I was asked to do this introduction, I realized that I could talk probably for the whole hour about Cindy's contributions. So I'll try to be brief. C Cindy is an extraordinary scientist and person. Uh, I know because we know each other for a long time and have worked together. Currently, Cindy is a scientist at the Anne Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Cindy graduated from Mount Holyoke and uh, soon after pursued her master's degree at SUNY Albany. And this is a, a, a remarkable story because the first paper that Cindy published is on uh, an important topic, axonal arborization, but it was published in science. Uh, and soon after she went to UCSD where she joined the Terry lab and put together with a bunch of other people, one of the first papers showing that, uh, showing neocortical damage in individuals with uh, HIV. That is about 1990 or so. And remember HIV showed up in our world in the early 80s. So that was a remarkable paper co-authored by Eliezer Mas Maslia, who is now director of the Division of Neuroscience at the National Institutes on, uh, on Aging. Cindy then came to the Brigham and uh, stayed, has stayed there really till now. But initially, she was working with Dennis Selko as a research uh, uh, assistant. Uh, she decided that she needed to continue her education, came to BU Pathology Department PhD program while working full time at the Selko lab. And this kind of arrangement, I don't know if it would be still possible, but it was possible then. And uh, she decided to, uh, to work uh, with me. And as I've already alluded, she already had been very experienced and independent. So uh, the relationship was uh, that I was as much uh, advised by her as I was her mentor. And so Cindy devised a, a, an important project and very unusual at the time. She was in charge of the Brigham and Women's Brain Bank and decided to study amyloid deposition in individuals with Down syndrome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Down syndrome results from the triplication of chromosome 21 and uh, the amyloid precursor protein resides on this chromosome. So there is an apparent overproduction of, and deposition of amyloid beta. Cindy studied people with as young uh, brains, post-mortem brains of people as young as three years of age and found that the earliest case with amyloid plaques was 12 years old. Uh, I'm not going to describe in detail what she found, but one of the inter important and interesting points is that those plaques became decorated with ApoE, uh, ApoProtein E, particularly at uh, older ages. Anyway, Cindy graduated, started working as more independent scientist at, at the Brigham, but continued her interest in uh, amyloid plaques. And she discovered uh, early on that those plaques uh, become decorated with components of the uh, complement cascade. And I think she's going to tell us more about this, but her interest in the complement goes back to those early days of studying Down syndrome brains. Um, in addition to her many contributions in this field, she's also one of the pioneers uh, of uh, the idea that uh, Alzheimer's disease can be treated with anti-amyloid therapy, both with active and passive immunization. Uh, so I know that today this is not her topic, but uh, maybe if there is time, we can ask her uh, her thoughts about the recently approved treatments that uh, employ this uh, strategy. 
in addition to being an, an excellent scientist and mentor, Cindy is an, an activist in the fight against Alzheimer's disease and is uh, a member of many organizations that focus on this, particularly uh, the Alzheimer's Association. Cindy is a very generous collaborator. So uh, if you find her, her uh, work of uh, particular interest to you, I am sure that she'll be happy to share her experience uh, with you. Um, well, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. That was the, I, I have to say that was the nicest, the very nicest uh, introduction I've ever had. And I'm going to move my table a little because the light is coming in here and you'll see that I still have a Christmas tree up <laughs> or the tree, but I have it there for a very specific reason. I was writing two NIH grants while I was sick at home and I kept the tree up just to keep me company, especially when it came on at night and I was working late. So I haven't taken it down yet, and I may not until I hear from about these grants. So it's more of a superstition thing now. But thank you, Christoph. That was really wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for all the, the mentoring. I think you were very generous saying that I was also a mentor to you. I don't think so, but I really appreciate all that you did for me uh, when I was at be you and, and since that time. And I think it really is a nice uh, testament to a positive experience when you stay in touch with people that have been a major part of your academic life. Um, and so I really appreciate it. And I will take you up on that coffee offer sometime soon. So today um, I'm gonna be talking about complement C3. We are still, by the way, doing a lot of anti-amyloid immunotherapy uh, work and I have many opinions about it. Um, so hopefully at the end we'll have time, but today I'll be talking about the role of complement C3 in the aging brain and neurodegeneration using new mouse models. These are mouse models that we've generated over the past couple of years. Oops, let me see if I can, hmm, okay. Do it this way. So these are my disclosures. I do a lot of consulting now, in particular with several companies that are start that are studying. Um, oh, I just realized Alnylam is not on here, but Alnylam and Apelis are actually uh, targeting complement in in neurodegeneration. So there's a lot of interest in this right now. So today I'll give a brief introduction to complement. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of our earlier work on germline C3 knockouts. So the, they're uh, missing complement C3 throughout the lifespan of the animal. And then I'll talk about the generation and characterization of our three novel inducible conditional C3 knockout mouse models. And these include a global knockout, a microglial specific knockout, and an astrocyte specific knockout. And then I'll give you a brief summary and, and where we're taking this next. So first of all, what is complement and why is it important? So Hopefully most of you have heard of complement before. It's the body's host defense system. Um, it's uh, activated very quickly upon infection, pathogen, injury, um, and, and it, it can eliminate pathogens and remove apoptotic cells and debris. It also can recruit microphage, macrophages and microglia to sites of injury or infection. For the most part, complement is synthesized in the liver, but it can be made locally by different cells throughout the body. And in brain in particular, it's made by glia and neurons, but it's also made by endothelial cells, for example, in the uh, vasculature. It's been shown to be elevated in brain with aging and Alzheimer's disease and associates with plaques and tangles. But there have been a number of additional roles for complement that have been proposed more recently. And this includes neurogenesis. So Marcella Pekna from uh, University of Gothenburg in Sweden has shown that both C3A and C5A signaling um, plays a role in neurogenesis uh, in the adult brain. And then uh, Beth Stevens' group, when she was with Ben Barris, she showed that uh, synaptic pruning is really important during brain development to provide to refine neural networks and that this is depending on C1Q and C3. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But there are additional roles. For example, C3, uh, both C3 and C1Q seem to play a very strong role in the response to stroke in the brain. Uh, and many of these uh, complement 
products have been found to be dysregulated or upregulated um, and the inhibitors downregulated in other neurodegenerative diseases beyond Alzheimer's. So in Parkinson's, TBI and stroke are just some of the examples, multiple sclerosis. This is a really simplified version of the complement system. There are about more than 40 uh, molecules in this, this system. There are three main entryways into activating the complement system. The classical pathway uh, is shown here, and it's, it basically is the formation of C1Q, which then binds to antigen antibody complexes, and then you get the development of the C3 convertase, which is made up of several smaller fragments of com uh, complement. And then C3 convertase is then cleaved to, or C3 convertase cleaves C3 into C3B. And then you also have an in, uh, inactivated form called IC3B. And those will both opsonize or coat pathogens. And then microglia will come in or ma macrophages in the periphery will come in and they have receptors such as CR1, CR3, um, and they will bind to um, opsonized particles. So pathogens, bacteria, that kind of thing. Um, and they will bind to that and eliminate it through the process of phagocytosis. This C3B can then go on to form C3, C5 convertase, which results in C5B, which then together binds together with C6, C7, and C8, and C9, and forms a pore in the membrane called the membrane attack complex. And this pore, when C9 eventually adheres to it, that pore then uh, opens the membrane and causes cell lysis, uh, which then kills that cell. Now there are also, the C3 convertase leads to C3A and C5 convertase leads to C5A generation. And these are both anaphylatoxins and they will then bind to receptors on macrophages and microglia. And, and there are even some receptors on neurons, but when they bind to their receptors, they typically will uh, recruit immune cells to the area, but mostly these are setting up a more pro-inflammatory response. However, with C5A, there, there are actually two different C5A receptors. There's a receptor one, which sets up a pro-inflammatory response, and receptor two, which is more of an anti-inflammatory response. And so Andrea Tenner, who's really a star in this field uh, in Alzheimer's, and so she's actually working on a drug to inhibit C5A R2, sorry, R1, but leave C5A R2 alone because it has positive effects. It's more of an anti-inflammatory. So as I mentioned, complement plays a role in many different conditions, including Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, brain development, the work from Beth Stevens group, stroke, there's a big stroke group studying complement in Italy, plays a role in obesity, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease. And now there's a lot of evidence that complement, not surprisingly, plays a role in COVID. And one of the things we're interested in is whether or not uh, complement plays a role in the long COVID especially the CNS symptoms, the brain fog and that sort of thing and, and loss of taste. Uh, so today I'll be talking about Alzheimer's disease specifically and both complement protein and mRNA levels have been found to be elevated in age brain and even more so in Alzheimer's brain. And this was work initially done by Peter Kellenboom in the Netherlands together with people like Joe Rogers and Patrick McGear in the US and Canada respectively. And complement fragments are, are associated with plaques and dystrophic neurites and tangles in the human AD brain. The activation of the classical pathway can be um, achieved by binding to an antibody, but Andrea Tenner's group and Scott Webster showed that C1Q can actually directly bind fibrillar beta amyloid, not monomeric, but only fibrillar beta amyloid, and that takes place at residue seven on, on beta amyloid. So that's one way that you can get a direct activation of the classical pathway. There's also some evidence for activation of the alternative pathway, and that was work done by Neil Cooper at the Scripps Institute a long time ago in the 80s and 90s. Um, so there have been two recent papers that are looking at interactions between APOE and, and complement C3 in Alzheimer's disease. And this is an area of interest, which we'll see at the end of this talk, why that's important. Um, but this is 
a study done and published in 2016 where this group um, Bonham et al looked at um, CSF samples and, and APOE genotypes of AB patients um, in the ADNI cohort. And what they found was that APOE4 was associated with CSF C3 levels, C3 actually goes down, um, and that that correlated with amyloid in the CSF. And if those three were correlated, then it also correlated with tau. Um, however, if you just looked at C3 versus tau, it did not correlate. However, Brasseron et al. in 2020 found that there was no association at all between CSF complement levels and APOE4 genotype in human CSF. And what I thought was interesting is that Brasseron um, looked at people that were negative for both amyloid and tau in the first column, tau positive only in the second column, amyloid positive only in the third column, and then both amyloid and tau or AD patients in the fourth column. And what they found was that tau was associated with increased C1Q. So here you can see there's an elevation in C1Q. Uh, amyloid only, <laughs> excuse me, amyloid only patients or individuals, I should say, um, had reduced C3. So here you can see that C3 is reduced uh, and C3B was reduced and factor H and factor H is an inhibitor uh, of C3. And then people that were positive for both amyloid and tau in CSF had increased C1Q and they had increased C4 levels uh, and they had reduced C3. And so the C3 levels were basically the same between people that were amyloid positive or amyloid and tau positive together. So one of the questions that we had was why is C3 lower in AB CSF? And we believe that that's probably due to two reasons. One is that complement does get deposited into plaques and associates with dystrophic neurites and tangles. So that would use up some of it. But the other is that as complement becomes activated, you're gonna get more and more cleavage of C3 into its downstream products. And so you might see less, uh, C, less whole C3 in the CSF. And I mentioned C complement does get um, deposited into plaques and associates with neuritic dystrophy and tangles. Um, but here, this is work by, done by Sarah Stoltzer when she was in my lab. She was a very talented uh, Harvard undergraduate who did her honors thesis in my lab. And this, this paper was actually published in 2000, so she was already uh, finished by then. Um, but this shows that in Down syndrome brains, where here, there's, this is a 29-year-old, 47-year-old, and 73-year-old, lots and lots of A-beta-42 positive plaques. They tend to be much more uh, compacted and cored uh, the older they, the person becomes. And this 73-year-old is very likely a chimeric mosaic for Down syndrome. Uh, and so what we see is that there is some C1Q associated with plaques at each of these ages at 47 and 73. It's very strongly associated. Uh, and part of this may be also due to fixation that we don't see as much in the younger cases because the younger cases that were under 30, uh, the tissues were fixed for years, not a matter of days or months. Whereas these older cases, the tissue is just fixed for a couple of hours. But you do see C3, uh, C1Q and C3 deposition very early on. And you see more of it as the age increases in Down syndrome. And then this is just looking at it uh, together with microglia and, and tau. And so uh, this is C1Q with tau, this is C1Q with microglia, ferritin as a marker, a very old fashioned marker, but uh, we did see co-localization. And then Harry Fu, who was a postdoc in my lab, uh, asked the question, does C3 play a role in microglia mediated A-beta clearance? So he cultured primary microglia from wild type mice, C3 knockout and CR3 knockout, which Unfortunately, it's called MAC1, but it has nothing to do with the membrane attack complex. It's really complement receptor three. Uh, and what he found was that if he incubated these primary microglia with fluorescently tagged A beta 42, he saw more intense staining in the C3 knockout and CR3 knockout mice, or sorry, less intense, more in the wild type and a reduction in the C3 knockout and CR3 knockout microglia. And he's found less uptake in these two deficient lines. And then he also used uh, 
the wild type mice and treated them with either control siRNA, C3 RNA, siRNA, or CR3 siRNA, and again, saw less uptake. And so this showed that there was partial uh, lo lowering of uptake and clearance of A-beta. Um, and he did a bunch of studies to show that it's by penocytosis. Pino um, but this, it doesn't knock it out completely. So there, it's partially mediating this effect, but not by itself. So this is to show the synaptic pruning that was um, first described by Beth Stevens in, when she was a postdoc in uh, Ben Barris's lab in California. And so Beth showed that uh, retinal ganglion cells in the vi developing visual cortex are very activity dependent to make strong synapses. And then Dory Schaefer in her lab worked with her later to show that this is microglial mediated. So what she found was that that astrocytes secrete a signal, those uh, retinal ganglion cells that are making a strong synapse um, with the relay neuron, dendrite, uh, they're healthy, they seem to do well. However, those that are weaker, and we're all born with too many neurons and too many synapses, so those that are weaker and aren't getting as much activity uh, get tagged by C1Q and C3 and IC3B. And this then, uh, recruits microglia to the site and microglia express the CR3 receptor, which then binds to the CR3, uh, sorry, to the C3 and IC3B and causes the uh, phagocytosis or elimination of those weaker synapses. And this is a way for the developing brain to refine its neural networks. And Beth and, and Dory Schaefer in her lab um, made a beautiful case for this and, and are now trying to figure out exactly what those signaling molecules are. So one big question that we had is, does complement play a role in synapse loss in the brain during aging and or Alzheimer's disease? So first we looked at aging. And this is work by Chao Chao Shi when she was a postdoc in my lab. And so she just compared wild type mice and germline C3 knockout mice that were made by Mike Carroll's lab at Boston Children's Hospital. And she found that if she aged these mice to 16 months, there was no, no difference in learning in the water TMAs, learning to find the platform. But when she reversed the platform and looked days later at the ability to find the new location, the C3 knockout mice were actually much better at finding the platform than the aged wild type mice. And then she also looked at uh, fear conditioning. And so in the learning trial on day one, she found that a small shock led to increased freezing in the C3 knockout mice. And on day two, when the mice were put back into the same box, but did not receive a foot shock, the C3 knockout mice seemed to remember that shock from the day before and froze more. She also did an LTP study, electrophysiology study, to look at hippocampal synapses and saw that at four months of age, there was no difference in the hippocampal synapses uh, in terms of LTP, but at 12 months of age, so with aging, there is this improvement or, or a higher level of LTP in the C3 knockout mice compared to wild type mice. And then lastly, she looked at synaptic puncta using VGLU2 as a presynaptic marker and HOMA1 as a postsynaptic marker. And she looked at P30, so postnatal day 30, four months of age and 16 months of age. And you can see that they're pretty similar between P30 and four months between wild type and C3 knockout mice. However, at 16 months of age, there's a tremendous loss of synaptic puncta in the wild type mice. And this is in hippocampal area CA3, um, which seems to be very, very uh, influenced by complement. And here you can see that there's rescue of those synapses in the absence of C3. So then work by Beth Stevens and Soy Young Hong, when Soy Young went from Dennis's lab to Soy Young's lab as a postdoc, and they were looking at younger animals. And what they did was they looked at uh, compared wild type mice versus C1QA knockout mice. And they infused these mice with either A beta monomer, shown in the hatch bars here, the stripe bars, or A beta oligomers. And the oligomers are known to be toxic. And they found that there was a loss of synaptic puncta in the oligomer treated mice and the wild type mice. But in the absence of C1Q, there was no loss. So C1Q seems to be playing a role in the loss of those synapses. They also 
uh, shown a similar effect by blocking uh, with an anti-C1Q antibody. They also did LTP studies and gave a control antibody shown here in red and saw that when they added a beta oligomers, there was a reduction in LTP, but that this was spared when they used the anti-C1Q antibody shown in green here. And this is just showing the same results in a graph form. So then they looked at, or our group then looked at whether C3 plays a role in late, uh, late AD. And I don't mean late onset, but I mean the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. So again, Cha Cha Shi did these studies, and this is showing the water teammates. So this is the reversal trial. This is more the memory component when the platform is in a new location. The clear or white bar here is the wild type group. This is the APPPS1. These are APPPS1 Delta E9 mice, 16 months of age. They have a significant deficit in the in spatial memory, and it's completely rescued in the present in, in the APPPS1 C3 deficient mice. And that is very similar to their, they behave very similar to the C3 knockout animals. And then she again looked at synaptic puncta, and you can you look at the co-localization of the pre and post-synaptic markers here, you can see that. Again, there's this loss of synaptic puncta in CA3, and then it's rescued in the absence of C C3 uh, in the APPPS1 model. And we see even more here in the C3 knockouts. But what was really interesting here was that even though we see better behavior, more synapses, we saw more plaques in these APP C3 knockout mice. And so Chow Chow actually looked at the different size plaques and quantified them. Each size, small, medium, and large, was increased, but the largest increase, 127% increase, was in the very large diffuse plaques. And so we started thinking maybe, maybe this is changing the microglia, maybe it's changing the compaction of the plaque. And so I think that's probably true. And I also think that there's an interaction between C3, TREM2, and APOE. And so we're uh, really working on this now. That's a, a big goal for the future. But what this taught us was that A beta is necessary, but not sufficient for Alzheimer's disease, that there's a downstream process that's really driving the neurodegeneration. So complement also plays a role in tauopathies. And this on the left, this is work from uh, Marcus Britschke when he was a postdoc in uh, Tony weiss Corey's lab. And so he overexpressed uh, S curry, which is an inhibitor of an, uh, an inhibitor of complement C3, he overexpressed this in a tau model, the P301L tau transgenic mouse model, and saw that there was a very strong reduction in um, AT8 positive cells or phosphorylated tau positive cells. Now he also um, crossed these the tau mouse model to a CD59. Uh, knockout mouse. And so this means that you're taking the breaks off of the membrane attack complex. So you're going to get more terminal complement uh, complex or, or the membrane attack complex. And sure enough, he found that there was um, more phosphorylated tau, there was synapse loss, and very strong neurodegeneration in that case. So complement is playing a role both in amyloid pathology and in tau pathology. And this is a very nice review article, if anyone's interested, from Hansen, Hansen, and Shang that came out in 2018. And in pink, you can see the different uh, areas, <clears throat> excuse me, the different parts of the complement cascade that have been manipulated in mouse models. There are some that have been manipulated in cell models as well. Um, but all of these have shown that in general, uh, reducing <clears throat> or knocking out C3 or increasing an inhibitor um, is actually protective in Alzheimer's mouse model, at least protective against synapse or neuron loss and has either no effect on amyloid burden or uh, in some cases, like in our studies, we've seen increased plaque burden. And this doesn't actually include a paper by Wu et al from Genentech that showed um, that they completely uh, replicated our work uh, in the APPPS1 mouse model. They did it in another amyloid mouse model, but they got the exact same thing. You'll notice here that there's one, there's one group here. It, it's actually one animal 
uh, genotype, J20 mice, that in the aged animals, when you knock them out for C3 or you overexpress the C3 inhibitor, you actually see increased plaques, but more neuritic dystrophy and synapse loss. And this was work from our lab here, and this was work from Tony Weiss Corey's lab. And we have both seen in other mouse models that, of, of amyloid um, that this does not occur. So it's something very specific to this J20 mouse model. So we dove a little bit deeper and looked at microglia and astrocytes in those mice, mouse models. And the microglial response to amyloid in the J20 mice seems to be very different than that of APP or APPPS1 mice. Um, so that may be part of, the, there may be some interaction there um, between the microglial response and the lack of C3 um, causing further degeneration instead of protecting against it. So our next big question was whether suppression of C3 signaling in adulthood would protect the brain against aging or if it could be initiated at early stages of Alzheimer's disease. So this wasn't worded very well, but what I mean is that we wanted to see, we know that if you knock out C3 during, you know, for the whole lifespan of the animal, it seems to be protective, but we really wanted to know what happens if you knock it out later in life. And that would get around the question of the developing brain. But also, if you have a therapy and you're trying to treat early, you know, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, you need to test that therapy at those stages. And so to do this, we collaborated with Mike Carroll's lab. Uh, he's at Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And so we generated these C3 Fox mice in which the exons two, three, and four are surrounded by LOX-P. Uh, sites and then with pre recombinant recombinase their excise. And so we it took a while to make those mice and characterize them, but we got it done. And then we uh, crossed these mice with what we thought were global C3 inducible knockout mice. So the first time we did it, we did it with UBC Cree mice. And just a warning, those mice leak Cree like crazy. Uh, so after two years, we were we had to start all over again from scratch, basically. So now we're using ROSA26 pre ERT2 mice, and this is a global knockout. And so when you give tamoxifen injections, uh, this is the estrogen receptor type two, which reacts to, you know, binds with tamoxifen. And so when you give a tamoxifen injection, you get the, the recombination, uh, which excises C3. Uh, and so this work that I'm gonna show you now is mostly done by Andre Batista, and Ezra Yelson is a postdoc in Mike Carroll's lab. And so Andre was in my lab. He's now in California, hoping to come back. Um, Ezra is a postdoc in Mike Carroll's lab. So she helped us set up a C3 ELISA. Um, getting reagents for complement is very difficult. And so, and C3 in particular is extremely finicky. So Mike Carroll has developed some really nice uh, antibodies and reagents and, and C3 in-house ELISA. So we now are using this. So. Andre injected mice at a young age with tamoxifen for five days, and then he waited and he collected serum at many different ages to look at uh, C3 lowering. And what he found on the left of all of these, the black bars are comparing their baseline levels of serum C3 uh, in C3 flox flox mice and in C3 IKO mice. And then on the right in the gray bars, you've got C3 flox flox treated with corn oil or tamoxifen, and then the C3, we're calling them C3 IKO, inducible conditionals, these are the rows of 26 C3, uh, treated with corn oil as a control or tamoxifen. And you can see that there's a very robust lowering of C3 in the serum, even at day seven. And as you go through the different time points here, you see that even out as far as day 240, it's very low. And we've seen this out, we've gone out as far as 365 days, and it continues to be about a 90 to 95% reduction in, in C3 levels in the serum. So next we wanted to check the liver and make sure that the expression of C3 is down in the liver since that's the major contributor or generator of C3 in the body. And so what we found was that on day 60 after tamoxifen injections, there was a significant reduction in C3 and that this persisted by day 150, it was still very low. But what was interesting is that we saw this sudden spike We saw this sudden spike of 
C1QA expression at day 60, but not at day 150. And we've seen this many times now where there's this initial rise in C1Q and then it goes down. And in fact, by day 360, it goes down even further. Uh, and, and at the same time, at day 150, we see an increase in factor H, which is an inhibitory, um, an inhibitor of C3. And then we also see this in increase in this inhibitor, another complement inhibitor, CD55. And we looked in brain. And again, in brain, we see a reduction in C3 at both time points. And again, we see this increase in C1Q in the brain. So it's, it's just kind of interesting. And in the brain, we also see at the later time point, but not the earlier time point, uh, reductions in factor I, which is another inhibitor of complement, and then reductions in some of the astrocyte and microglial markers. So... Andre went ahead and he looked at one year later, and this is doing mRNA analysis in the brain at 16 to 17 months. And he was looking at the late effects here and found that, excuse me, uh, C1QA mRNA is actually reduced uh, in the C3, knock, C3 conditional knockouts after tamoxifen injections and pretty much mimics what's seen in the constitutive germline C3 knockouts. And this is again true for C1QB and C1QC. And then in terms of the C3AR, you see that there's a trend for a reduction uh, in both the tamoxifen treated C3IKO and C3 germline knockout. And again, of course, the C3 is very low uh, in, the, um, in the brain at, uh, this is one year after tamoxifen injection and matches the C3 knockouts. And then he also looked at two components that together make up CR3, the complement receptor 3. And again, you can see that there's a reduction in the tamoxifen that's close to that of a C3 knockout mouse. We also found that uh, C he looked at C1Q protein. Uh, and this is these mice were treated with tamoxifen at four to five months of age. And then he looked at 15 to six or 16 to 17 months. In a second study, these were a little bit, these mice were a little bit older, and he looked at 15 to 16 months of age. And so you can see that again, there's this reduction in C1Q in the serum uh, and in the brain. And this is true, especially in the uh, tamoxifen treated mice. It is lower also in the C3 germline mice. Um, and it's down here, it's shown again in serum. And then here, these are synaptosomes that were isolated from the hippocampus. And so again, we see that the protein, it's not just the mRNA, but the protein level itself is also reduced. And then we wanted to look at other immune genes. And so again, these mice were injected with tamoxifen or corn oil at four to five months of age. And then uh, a year later, they were examined. And you can see that there's a reduction in interferon alpha and beta, uh, which are pro-inflammatory, and then a reduction in IL-1 beta. But we see this increase in TGF beta and its receptor, which is thought to be more of an anti-inflammatory response. But what I thought was really interesting is that we also see this uh, reduction of APOE. We, we looked at this and this, this was the first time we actually looked at the, the expression of APOE in these mice. And so this is a year after tamoxifen injection you can see that there's a significant reduction in APOE expression in the brain and also in the C3 germline mice, which we'd never looked before uh, in those C3 germline mice at, at APOE, but it's really interesting. And what's really interesting too is that it's not reduced in the liver. So this is a very brain specific effect. So it probably has to do with some complicated signaling cascade that's, you know, that eventually is uh, affecting APOE. And this is why I think that there's some correlation. TREM2 and APOE have been uh, shown to be, to, to work together, to orchestrate together, to cause compaction of plaques and clearance of amyloid. So I think that there is a, a, a strong role for C3 somewhere in that pathway. And then we also looked at uh, synaptic puncta in these animals one year post tamoxifen injection. You can see that in this study, there's an increase in pre and post synaptic puncta and the co-localized puncta are also 
uh, higher in the tamoxifen treated mice than in the corn oil treated mice, and that they're closer. Here we only had two C3 knockouts, so they're high too. Uh, and then Andre also looked at synaptosomes from the hippocampus that he isolated. And then the synaptosomes, he saw the increase in presynaptic molecules, but not in postsynaptic. And this could be for a variety of reasons. They're different preps, uh, uh, but at least he saw an increase in presynaptic, but not postsynaptic uh, elements of the synapse. And so then Andre and a technician in the lab, Marin Schroeder, performed a number of behavioral tests uh, in two cohorts of mice. So in the first, again, they're um, treated with tamoxifen or corn oil at four to five months of age. And the second, they were treated at seven to eight months of age. And then they were all tested for behavior between 15 and 16 months of age, which even wild type mice show some deficits at that age. Uh, and so what you can see is that uh, this is a spatial novelty Y maze. The mice are put in this uh, y maze, one arm is blocked, and then they explore, and then they go, they're put back into the maze, and the novel arm is open, the door is taken away, and so they're able to explore the novel arm. A happy, healthy mouse will explore the novel arm, spend more time there. Um, and so what we see is that the tamoxifen treated mice do spend more time uh, exploring the novel arm in study one. And again, we see this in study two. So study two also has C3 knockouts. Uh, treated with corn oil and tamoxifen. And so you see that the tamoxifen C3 IKO, as well as the C3 germline knockouts, all perform better than the other mice in this study. And it's uh, both in terms of the percent time in the novel arm and the percent distance. And then we also looked at novel arm recognition, uh, which is a spatial memory test. And you can see, again, there is this uh, increase in the discrimination index in the tamoxifen treated mice, so with C3 lowering. And again, in the second study, we see the same thing and they basically mimic the C3 germline knockouts. And what's nice here is that we don't see a difference in the germline knockouts between corn oil and tamoxifen. So that's good, the tamoxifen is not causing detrimental effects. And then we also did displaced object recognition, which is a location memory test. And again, we see, uh, better performance by the tamoxifen treated mice and that this matches the C3 knockout mice. So Xiaoming Li, who is uh, an, an expert in electrophysiology, he's part of Dennis Selko's lab, um, he does a lot of synaptic uh, recordings. And so we use these uh, S26C A beta dimers. These were developed by Dominic Walsh when he was in Dennis's group in his own lab uh, and record at LTP. So if you add these to a mouse, for example, a mouse hippocampus slice, a wild type mouse that's uh, treated with uh, vehicle artificial CSF, the LTP level is here. These are three different doses of the oligomers, these eight beta dimers, and you can see that they all cause a very significant reduction in LTP. Uh, and then we took the C3 IKO mice, we took hippocampal slices. So some of these mice shown in black were treated with corn oil and some were treated with tamoxifen. So they had C3 lowering. When we added A beta dimers to them, you can see that there was lower LTP in the corn oil treated mice. So C3 lowering did uh, improve LTP or did protect against the A beta dimers. So, we're, we're actually, this whole story right now is about to be submitted. Um, and we have crossed these mice now to APP knock-in mice. And they're on the last of five behavioral test paradigms right now. They're, they're 15 months of age. We know that we see very strong C3 lowering in serum in these animals. Um, so we're really excited. And hopefully by AAIC, we'll have all the data. Uh, from these mice that have been crossed to the APP knock-ins. So next we have been generating these cell-specific mice. And the first one was a microglial specific mouse model. And we crossed the C3 flox mice with the CX3, CR1, CRE, ERT2 mice. And we give tamoxifen, C3 is excised. And we have looked in the serum at different time points. And what we see is that there is no um, 
this is day 7, 30, 60, up to 150, there's no difference in the serum C3 levels in these mice. But that's what we would expect. Microglia are in the brain, there, aren't a, there, aren't, there isn't as much expression. And C3 is mostly expressed by astrocytes in the brain, um, not microglia, but microglia can express it. When microglia become activated, the levels of C3 go up very quickly uh, and very strongly. But we did not see any difference in the serum C3 levels in this mouse model. When we did brain homogenics, we also didn't see any overall, but this is a bulk, uh, this is the entire brain homogenate, all the different cell types. And so, you know, we see a little tiny lowering, but it's not significant. Um, we are in the process now of doing um, isolation of microglia from these mice. And right now we see about a 30% lowering. And we don't know if that's because we looked at mice about a year after they were injected with tamoxifen and cornea or cornea. And it might be that, that there might be some infiltration. So uh, CX3, CR1 is also expressed in myeloid cells. So there is the possibility that we're getting some myeloid cell turnover in the periphery that those cells are then as the mice age, some of those cells may be getting into the brain. But these mice don't have A beta. They don't really have any strong pathology in the brain. Um, they're wild type mice. So, um, you know, we're not exactly sure what's going on, but we think that we uh, may be getting some turnover of, so that the newer cells as the mice are aging are not, um, not having as much C3 lowering. Uh, and so we're about to switch now. We've ordered TMEM119 uh, Cree ERT2 mice. And those TMEM119 is much more specific for microglia and will avoid the peripheral cell uh, issue. But what we have seen is that in the spatial novelty YMAs in these mice, again, they're, they were 14 to 15 months of age when they were tested. There was no difference in, in spatial memory here. But in the novel object recognition and displaced object recognition, we did see a significant um, improvement in the tamoxifen treated animals compared to the cornoil treated animals. We've also made an astrocyte specific C3 IKO mouse model. And this is done by crossing C3 flops flops with the ALDH101 Cre ERT2 mice. When you give tamoxifen, there's uh, excision of C3. And what we have seen is that there is no lowering of C3 in the plasma. This is a newer model, so we've only gone out to day 30 uh, in terms of the serum. Uh, but we see no, no real difference. There's a slight difference here, um, but it's not significant at all. And interestingly, we do see a trend for better behavior in the spatial model to Y maze, but not in novel object recognition or novel object location. Um, however, when we did the LTP study with the S26 dimers, if you look at, I always have to think about this for a second. Um, if you look at just the tamoxifen treated, which is the black line here. So this is vehicle, uh, vehicle, like not A beta dimers, but vehicle mice with tamoxifen here, you can see a relatively high, um, LTP. And then when you look at the S26 with tamoxifen, it's the blue line here. So it's up right around the same level as wild type. And then when you look at the uh, mice that were treated with corn oil, so they did not have C3 lowering, you can see that when the A beta dimers were applied to those hippocampal slices, there was a deficit in LTP. So here again, it looks like knocking out C3 and astrocytes might be protective, but we're in the midst of doing many more studies and they're the next group up for behavioral testing coming up. And we did isolate astrocytes from these animals and we see about a 50 to 60% lowering in the uh, astrocytes in these animals. And again, it's out in much, you know, very old animals at 12 months of age. And so, we're going to set up some studies where we look at different time points to see if it's more robust early on in terms of C3 lowering. So uh, lastly, 
this is just, we've shown that C3 IKO mice shows the same C3 lowering and protection from age-related synapse loss and cognitive decline, C3 lowering affects expression in other immune genes, and timing does matter. As I showed in the beginning, there are differences looking at the different time points after tamoxifen in many of the different in, uh, immune genes or inflammatory genes. <laughs> and then we've already crossed the APP mice, the APP NLGF mice to the C3 IKO mice. And they're not only have they been bred, but they've been aged and they're in the process of undergoing behavioral testing right now. And then we have contracted with Jackson Laboratory, they're crossing the PS19 mice to our global C3 IKO mice. Uh, and they won't be ready for almost a year from now, but uh, these all take an incredibly long period of time. Um, but they are underway and hopefully next year we'll have some data by a year from June or July. Uh, but the idea here is to knock down C3 globally at very early stages of amyloid and tau pathology in these models. And then we are moving on with our astrocyte and microglial specific conditional knockouts. And as I mentioned, we're going to switch to the TMEM 119 mice. Um, we're still going to characterize and finish the C3, CX3 CR1 mice, but I think we'll be better off using TMEM 119. And the C3 flox mice and the C3 IKO mice on the Rosa 26 background are currently available from my lab through an MTA. We've got an MTA set up now. We're already starting to give these mice out. And then once we get our paper out, the one that we're working on right now, um, we're, we're going to actually submit these mice to Jackson Laboratory and they will distribute them. So the key takeaways for today, we've generated three novel C3 inducible conditional knockout mouse models to allow for C3 lowering globally or specifically within microglia or astrocytes at any age. These models will be crossed or already have been crossed to Alzheimer-like models to better understand complement signaling pathways in Alzheimer's pathogenesis and disease progression and possibly identify novel therapeutics. We might not want to knock out C3 in the entire body because that's very important for host defense against pathogens. However, if we can find signaling pathways and find something downstream that would be better to block uh, or block even C3 specifically in the brain, we might have uh, success with that in terms of the therapy. And then lastly, these models can be used to understand the role of C3 signaling in other diseases and conditions such as Parkinson's, MS, TBI. I have collaborators now who want the mice for heart and lung research, uh, ischemia, and then we have a big interest in long COVID and uh, knocking out C3 in those models and seeing what happens. And then lastly, I'd like to thank my lab and Andre Batista, who I'm going to see for the first time since last summer, is going to be here today for an immunity meeting in Boston. Uh, and he did the, a tremendous amount of this work for us. Uh, Brigendra Singh took over his position as a postdoc in the lab. Maria Josie Papavergi is working on this now. And Emma Spooner, who is a uh, student working in the lab. And then lastly, I'd like to also thank Mike Carroll's group. They've been great. And Xiaoming Li, who helped with the uh, phys electrophysiology and Oleg Butovsky, who helps provide uh, microglial specific antibodies uh, for our uh, fact sorting of the uh, microglia when, uh, when we're doing the microglia conditional mouse model. And with that, I'll stop. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about 